Joe Bacina is with us today. He is our sponsor and he will be providing our sponsor briefing. Mr. Bacina is a policy and research director for the National Security Commission on Emerging Biotechnology and has more than 15 years of experience working at the intersection of biotechnology and national security. Joe, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Nia. Uh, good morning to everyone. I appreciate you joining. I'd like to give you an overview of our commission and also our interest uh, in this study. So here's our formal mandate. Uh, this is something that the U.S. government does occasionally when there's a specific area where they'd like to dedicate uh, a group of folks, both experts in the field that serve as commissioners and staff members uh, that kind of do the day-to-day -day work towards a, an area where they need either more bandwidth or more expertise dedicated to it. Uh, so in our case, we're looking at the intersection of emerging biotech and national security, and we'll get into exactly what that means. But this has been done for some other areas you, you may be familiar with, um, artificial intelligence. There was just a commission recently, um, cybersecurity, that sort of thing. So we're continuing on in that tradition. And we were established in fiscal year 22 through the NDAA. Um, we actually started our operations uh, a little over a year ago in March of 2023. Um, you'll see the, the scope mentioned again. Um, we have a dozen commissioners uh, who I'll get to in more detail on the next slide, but you can kind of think of them as our board of directors. They provide strategic guidance uh, and ultimately make the decisions on what we recommend as a commission. Uh, of note, we have four congressional commissioners. Uh, it's an even split between House and Senate. Uh, Democrat and Republican. Uh, the the other commissioners are all leaders from government, industry, academia. Uh, we are resourced through DOD, so that's where we get our funding. And staff like myself are DOD hires who are immediately detailed to the commission. And here's a closer look at our commissioners. Uh, you'll see starting at the top left, our chair is Jason Kelly, who's the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, but serves on the commission in his personal capacity. Um, likewise, our vice chair, Michelle Rozo, is serving in her personal capacity. Uh, her day job is with Incutel, and she's held a number of government roles at the intersection of biotech and national security. Uh, here are the senators and representatives that I mentioned uh, that serve as sitting members uh, on the commission. Uh, this is a really exciting thing for us. Um, no other past commissions have had four members of Congress. Um, we think this will be really advantageous to us as we start to work for, um, you know, towards advocating for our agenda and trying to see it enacted. Um, and then you'll see in the bottom row there that these other six commissioners round out and, you know, you can see some of the, the great past experience we have represented here from industry with Commissioner Eric Schmidt, um, and government, uh, Commissioner Don Myricks, who was head of uh, s and at CIA. Um, and then we have academic experience as well. Commissioner Angie Belcher is a professor at MIT and so on. I think it's helpful to spend a little bit of time breaking down what we focus on. Again, this intersection of national security and biotechnology. Uh, a lot of people, when they see our name, tend to think uh, this is a commission that would focus on, say, bioweapons or pandemic preparedness. Um, and we do a little bit of work in that space, but it's really not our main focus. As you can see here at the top, um, we are not just looking at national defense, intelligence, the things that you might traditionally associate with the term national security. We're also looking at economic competitiveness, supply chain resilience, uh, food security, uh, all things that I think are important parts of a more holistic conception of national security, um, including, especially on the economic side, when we think of key considerations like strategic competition with China. Um, so think broad as, as we consider national security, uh, but a little more narrow when we consider biotechnology. Now, this definition of biotechnology here is pretty wide ranging, but it's important to note that we, are, uh, we focus on emerging biotechnology. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff, for instance, small molecule drugs, the drugs you're all familiar with, things like Advil or, you know, prescription antibiotics. Um, these small molecule drugs are things that we, we generally would not focus on because the, the tech is not novel. It's been around for a while. 
Um, now, there are exceptions. Uh, for instance, there's a, a company that uses a synthetic biology method for synthesizing the precursors and key starting materials of small molecule pharmaceuticals. So if, if there's a novel aspect to uh, to the method there, as it is for this particular company, um, that's a group we would be interested in talking to. That's something that would fall into our remit uh, as the commission. And so you'll see on the, the left-hand side, depending on how big your computer screen is, uh, this is probably a bit of an eye chart. And it is, I think, 12 components of our mandate uh, that is pretty wide ranging to include all the way at the bottom there, uh, letter L, any other matters that we deem relevant to national security. Um, so in a bid to make this a little more manageable and tell a little bit more of a, a narrative as we go about our work, um, we started in our first phase of work, breaking it down to these four work streams that you see on the right-hand side. Um, so first looking at choke points in the biotech industry, um, how can we position the US so that um, either we have control over them or at least we're not vulnerable to them. And I think uh, a very helpful recent historical analogy here is uh, chips and semiconductors, right? So TSMC is this world leading company uh, with, uh, with regards to semiconductor design and manufacturing. Um, that's a company where we're very vulnerable to a disruption if, if there's a geopolitical situation between Taiwan and mainland China, as an example. We want to kind of get ahead of that with biotech and uh, specifically, I'd say, with biomanufacturing, as that becomes more important to our economy and to national security. Um, looking at group two, uh, this is focused on the prevention of misuse of emerging biotech and promoting norms and standards for responsible use. So uh, I talked earlier about how we don't focus primarily on biodefense, um, but anything along those lines would go into this work stream. Uh, and that includes, I think, newer concerns where um, biotech intersects or converges with other technology areas. Uh, so I think one good example here is looking at uh, the intersection of biotech and artificial intelligence. Uh, to give a more specific example, a lot of these companies like OpenAI, uh, who have large language models like ChatGPT have been doing some sort of red teaming to assess whether use of their large language model uh, could potentially lower the barriers to entry for building a bioweapon. So that that's the sort of newer examples of misuse uh, that haven't been as well covered that we want to focus on. Uh, and then I think the norms and standards piece, um, a lot of the, the norms in R&D for biotech are rooted in an earlier era, in a post-World War II, Cold War era. Um, the landscape has changed so much in terms of what technology we're focusing on, how quickly it moves, especially with uh, AI as part of the mix now, um, what the geostrategic environment looks like. So we'd like to, to kind of do a, a refresh of those norms and standards as the technology and geopolitical landscape has changed. So that's another area we're looking at. Third, um, what's over the horizon for biotech, um, including this tech convergence issue that I mentioned earlier, and how does the US get there first? Um, so there's a few dimensions to that. One is, you know, again, tech convergence. So biotech and AI is a big one for us, but there are other areas we're looking at like biotech and quantum computing, uh, biotech and automation. Uh, there's a few more. And then I think we're also interested in the, we'll call it the art and science of horizon scanning. How do we get a better sense for what's coming down the pike, say five or 10 years down the road, whether it's for biotech specifically or biotech converging with some of those other areas I talked about, um, because there's a, a lot of things we can do to lay the groundwork, both in terms of promoting some of these technology areas, uh, but also preparing for the risks that come uh, from those, whether it's something that's happening dom happening domestically or something that we we could see in a competitor nation, for instance. Uh, so that's group three. Uh, the last group we're looking at here is uh, looking at, at partnerships, uh, both in terms of how we can develop a bio-ready government and then also a, bi a more bio-literate America. Um, this is a really multifaceted group, and in a lot of ways, it supports the, the other three work streams. But think about better public-private partnerships here in the U.S. Um, also, how can we be better partnered with our allies? Um, and then on the bioliteracy side, we this includes m many considerations, but I'd say there's some broad considerations, like how does this play into 
um, reskilling efforts for the workforce? Um, you know, do we need a K through 12 curriculum for biotech for the country? Uh, and then more narrowly, and perhaps more immediately, uh, bioliteracy for U.S. government policymakers. So um, we are very keenly interested in this uh, as a commission because Congress is going to be deciding whether or not they want to implement our recommendations. Uh, so we want to make sure that they're, uh, they have a base level of knowledge and can make informed decisions. Um, but, you know, other U.S. government policymakers and extending beyond the lifespan of the commission, uh, we at least want some uh, a base level of bioliteracy for our leaders uh, so that they can make smart choices in this space. All right. So uh, a quick look back at what we did in our first year. Uh, so we did build the team. We've got about 20 full time staff. I think it gets up to 25 if you include fellows, uh, special government employees, part time staff. Um, we had uh, the working group meetings. So each of those four work streams that I mentioned on the last slide uh, had a working group associated with them. Uh, and we had monthly meetings there. And then we had meetings of our full commission, uh, which includes all the, the commissioners that you saw a little bit earlier in the deck and staff. Um, we really made an effort to engage with any stakeholders that we thought could contribute to our, our sort of initial get smart phase of work. So you'll see uh, this meant reaching out to um, academia, industry, think tanks, um, some international discussions as well, and, and of course, the U.S. government itself. Uh, we did uh, write and deliver our interim report. So it was submitted formally last December and rolled out publicly in January. And that, along with our white papers, can be found on our website. It's biotech.senate.gov. Um, the interim report, I think, does a, a really nice job of stage setting uh, for our work this year. And then the white papers, you can think of as more bite-sized pieces aimed to educate largely on issues that we're interested in, uh, kind of lay the groundwork for some of the recommendations that we'll have in our final report. Um, at times when we have a legislative uh, you know, window of opportunity, we will publish a white paper outlining some legislative uh, policy options that we're considering as a commission. Um, and this is just a little bit more on the, the interim report. The recommendations that are in there, I talked a, a bit about uh, you know, targets of opportunity. We thought we'd have one last year with the, uh, the farm bill reauthorization. Uh, it ended up kind of getting kicked down the road to hopefully this year, but we did go ahead and make some recommendations. So you can see how far along we got in that particular area. And I think that's a nice model for what we'll be doing in other areas in our final report. Um, also, you know, the second bullet here, that's really the stage setting that I mentioned, giving people a sense for what we plan to work on in the next you know, year or so before we release that final report. Uh, part of the goal there was to get a sense from the community and different stakeholders if we're largely on the right track, if there's areas that we're missing. And while we got some great feedback, I don't think we heard anything that made us pause about our overall course of action. So that was a, a very valuable gut check for us. And, uh, and we felt like we got a good vote of confidence from different members of this, uh, of this community. Uh, and again, you can access the report on the website biotech.senate.gov. All right, so looking ahead to uh, throughout this year and beyond, uh, what will we be doing? Well, certainly we'll be continuing our research. Um, you know, the, the NASM project uh, is, is part of that. Um, we are also, I'd say, shifting gears a little bit so that the research is less open-ended and geared towards getting smart on our, our mission space and more focused on supporting uh, specific policy recommendations that we're considering for the final report. So still researching, but in a little more focused way. Uh, we do have that final report coming up early next year. Um, the interim report laid the groundwork for the specific areas we wanna cover. The big difference will be bringing policy recommendations forward on each of those areas. And then after the final report is released and a little bit along the way, um, we do have about a year and a half after the final report through late 2026 to uh, really educate and I'd say, you know, expand on our recommendations. Um, part of that will just be, you know, talking to people about the report, uh, whether it's in more one-on-one, uh, -on -one, say, government meetings, uh, hitting the conference circuit, pre presenting our findings, that sort of thing. Um, and we'll continue to put out 
white papers, research reports where it makes sense. But we'd like to get the bulk of our recommendations out there in that final report uh, and then start making the case for why we should be implementing that agenda. Uh, so that brings us to today and uh, the NASM workshop and, uh, and the entire project. Uh, hopefully, having heard the first part of this presentation, you know, some some light bulbs are clicking in your head about why why we'd be interested, but uh, I'll just make some of those connections explicit. So um, that forecasting piece, especially on convergence of emerging tech areas, is really central to that uh, that pillar of our work, pillar number three, where we're looking at horizon scanning and, and what's coming next. Uh, there's definitely a lot of interest in uh, AI, machine learning, automation, and how that intersects with biotech, I'd say in particular. Uh, there's currently a legislative moment. Uh, you may have seen uh, an announcement today from a few uh, senators' offices. Um, Senator Schumer, Senator Todd Young, who's a member of the commission, um, have put forth some proposals related to artificial intelligence. And we were very pleased to see biotechnology get a mention. Uh, and we want to make sure that continues to be the case. Um, and, and then I think it's important to consider national security implications, uh, both on the promote and protect sides of this intersection of AI and biotech. The protect side sometimes gets a little more press. I think the promote side is equally important. Um, you know, even if you want to take the stance uh, that sometimes the best defense is an offense. So more concretely, let's say we've got we've got a bad guy that wants to do something bad with AI applied to biotechnology, build some sort of super bug. Um, well, on on the the defensive side, um, promoting biotech and AI for things like better diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines, um, promoting the tech for those defensive uses is also very important. So um, we want to make sure that promote and protect get uh, both get their equal due. Um, and then engaging with really as much of the stakeholder community as we can is important for us, not just to inform our ideas, but some of these stakeholders will take part in, you know, fingers crossed, if we get some of these recommendations implemented, uh, or, or I should say funded, then part of the implementation and execution uh, will rely on non-governmental stakeholders. So uh, we want to engage folks now so that we're getting their input and uh, at least making them aware of what we're doing. Um, and then in terms of how the workshop statement explicitly aligns with our mission, um, I talked about the, the research work we're doing at, at, in choke points. And so I, I think looking at um, AI and automated labs for biotech, um, this is an area where there may be some choke points either now or developing in the future. So we want to make sure that we understand that. Um, for the norms and preventing misuse piece, um, I think there are there is a potential for AI and automated labs to uh, to be associated with misuse of biotech. So uh, we want to make sure that that we take any opportunity to work towards preventing that, uh, especially while it's still relatively early days for the incorporation of AI and automation into labs. Um, we want to set, for instance, security by design as an important principle now, um, rather than you know seeing an issue further down the road and trying to work backwards to fix it. Uh, the partnerships piece, I think there's a, a few different dimensions there. Um, you know, data is one where this is not something we can do in a vacuum. Uh, certainly going to have to rely on partnerships with industry um, and also uh, with the international community as well. Um, you know, uh, developing an R&D network, uh, this is something that by definition will involve both government, industry, uh, and also the academic world, I should say, too. Um, you know, in terms of horizon scanning, um, this is one where uh, I think defense capability needs uh, will be forecasted by DOD, but we want to think about how innovative biotech can help meet those needs. And, and that's something that we hope to get out of these uh, these meetings as well. All right, so I think big picture, um, left-hand side here, you know, facilitating connections to experts and practitioners at this important intersection of 
AI machine learning automation and biotech, um, getting a better understanding of what's possible in terms of legislative actions uh, and the topics that we cover uh, throughout the NASM activity. Uh, and then a sense of what actions the community is focused on at that AI, ML automation intersection with biotech. Um, you know, we we have a sense of things from conversations, but uh, a lot of times it is really helpful to engage with the actual practitioners. Um, they're the ones out there doing the research. They've got the best situational awareness. Uh, and so we want to learn from the experts there. Um, more specifically, moving to the right-hand column here, uh, we are very interested in promoting innovation at the AI bio intersection. So ideas that our participants have there will be very welcome. Um, how can we do better horizon scanning? Uh, I think part of it might be just better connectivity between uh, the people in government that need to know this information and the people out in the world, whether it be researchers, venture capitalists, people working at startups who are really on the cutting edge. Uh, but beyond that, I know there's a lot of methodologies uh, to do forecasting, prediction, whatever you'd like to call it better. Uh, and, and we're interested in learning more about those. Um, and then lastly, this intersection we keep talking about, how can it be used better for national defense? Um, and again, taking a pretty broad conception of national defense. So that brings me to the end of the formal presentation. I'd be glad to, to take a pause here and see if anyone has any questions. Hey, Joe, it's uh, it's Jim Brazzi. Um, just to, um, I, I know you guys, yeah, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, take, take a broad view of what we're talking about in terms of national defense. Um, but do you have in mind sort of any balance between, um, you know, how much you're, how much of the output of this you want to be focused or driven by sort of biomedical applications versus more bioeconomy applications? Or, or my, just to, to continue with that, <clears throat> I think my, my general thinking is that, you know, we think of this as sort of the technology platform that mm -hmm. has a number of different application areas in these um, areas and, and focus more on that platform view of this you know, as, as opposed to going from applications to, to technical needs, going from platform to, to potential impacts of it in different areas. Does that make, does that view make sense taking this sort of platform view as sort of an organizing? Yeah. Approach? So I, I, I do like the platform approach uh, because I think there are a lot of benefits that, that can come with it. And also this isn't always true, but sometimes industry and, and R&D as well is a little more focused on the application and a little less focused on the platform. So it seems like a good place where we can sort of maybe maybe balance out a little bit. Um, I do think to your the, the earlier dimension of that question, um, I would say we are more focused on the bioeconomy than therapeutics. I mean, you could you could also make the case that therapeutics and pharma and biotech are an important part of the bioeconomy. Uh, but I think that that part of the bioeconomy does pretty well on its own. It's been established. There's a market for it, especially in pharma. Some of the newer biotechs, I understand, uh, are getting started. And, and there's other aspects like, you know, vaccines where uh, where the market maybe doesn't support it uh, as robustly as we'd like from a, a public interest or national security perspective. But I think bioindustrials is is definitely a big focus area for us. Um, you know, biotech and agriculture other areas that may not get uh, as much support from the market um, and that align with national security needs. So I think probably a little more focused on the bioeconomy than on, you know, traditional pharma biotech uh, and, you know, certainly interested in both platforms uh, and applications. But I think uh, with, with perhaps a special interest in platforms, given some of the things we discussed. Thanks. Hey Joe, it's nice to see you. I have a, a quick question for you as well. Um, so before I begin, thanks again for the, the overview. It's always super helpful to, to get uh, the bigger picture before we kind of jump into specifics. But um, I'm hoping we can kind of touch on the prioritization between methodologies to address some of these questions and the answers to some of these questions. So in an ideal world, both would be front and center of uh, what we're able to produce. Um, but I'm curious, uh, horizon scanning aside where the methodologies look uh, to be 
heavily emphasized for the other areas for prioritization of different approaches for building innovation programs, things like that. Um, to what extent does a methodology there uh, help your your future work? Is that relevant or uh, are you really looking for kind of the more concrete answer? Go do this. In other words. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, this is a bit of a cop out. And it's good to see you as well, Jess. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you saying that about the presentation. I know you've seen it a few times. Um, yeah, I, I think we are interested in in both. You know, at the end of the day, we're interested in actionable recommendations that we can put through uh, into legislation. So if if there's an idea out there where we instantiate a methodology, either as part of, you know, an existing program or uh, kind of being being brought to fruition through a new program, then I think absolutely like let, let's pursue that. If it's something where, you know, an existing government program is there, um, I'll get in trouble with uh, with any with others at the commission if I try to give a specific example. So let's just say very abstractly, um, there's a group in government that already does this sort of work, and we just need them to allocate some funding and resources towards a specific area because we find out through in part through our work with NASM that this is an area that that really deserves more focus. Um, that, then that that's also a win for us. So I, I think I'd, I'd want to keep an open mind, and, and it's. It's true for the horizon scanning. We're we're more interested in the methodology. I think we ideally like to do a, a point in time snapshot in our report too. Uh, maybe looking three to five years down the line about uh, what we think important uh, biotech and biotech convergence areas will be. Um, but that that's one where because we're only around for a little bit of time, um, we we really would lean more towards a methodology than any one specific answer. Fair enough. Thanks. And Joe, thank you, thank you again for the overview. And maybe just to build on, uh, I think Jim's question about sort of thinking about portfolio balance, and then Jess's is about frameworks. So particularly for thinking about the uh, biotech applications for defense and security, curious, do you, do you have uh, a preference on sort of how we uh, structure our thinking recommendations there? And in particular, is it useful for us to keep in mind sort of like things like the national security strategy or the national defense strategy, where they have sort of laid out, you know, top level uh, strategic priorities? Uh, should we take that into account as we're thinking about biotech applications as like a means to that end? Or do you have a different way of us thinking about sort of prioritizing the, the many places that this could have an impact in those disciplines? Yeah, so uh, I, we're not tied to any one framework. I think that's a great question. Um, so no, no preference there, no need to align to, uh, you know, a previous document like the national security strategy or even the bioeconomy EO, which we are tracking closely. Um, but I would say I'll get you guys a list. We're in the process now because we're kind of shifting from our first phase of work that was more kind of educational, get smart in nature to the second phase of work focus more on developing these policy recommendations. Um, we do have some some kind of new buckets for how we're organizing our work streams. So I, I'd like to send those over maybe to Kavita and Nia uh, for distribution to the group, because uh, that will give you a sense for how our final report will be structured, the areas we're focusing on. So it's things like a top, off the top of my head, I'll give you a few examples, um, data, infrastructure, regulation, strategic investment and financing. Um, and, and that may be a nice framework uh, under which to group some of the recommendations. That That's super helpful. Thank you. Sure. Does anyone else have any other questions? I'll just I'll just say hi to Joe and thanks. Um, don't have any specific qu question right now. Other people ask them, so we were we were prepared for you today. <laughs> <laughs> now, thanks, Diane. Good to see you too, and uh, I really like your background. I got to work. Well, thanks. On mine. This is um this is uh, Bocale Castle. As you know, I collect pictures of castles and put them in my background. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. To keep it entertaining. <laughs> I like it. Okay, well, I think we are good for now. I'm sure at some point in time, Joe, that we will follow up with commission, I mean, with questions for the commission from the committee. Um, so I'll make sure that you get those as they do come up. But I will say thank you for your time today. Um, I appreciate it. And um, we'll be in touch. 
Well, my pleasure. And thanks to you and Kavita and all the committee members for, uh, you know, volunteering to do some work in this space. We really appreciate it.